We're joined this evening by Richard Ramratan, the Managing Director of Renergy TT. He is an energy or renewable energy engineer who specializes in electrification versus oil and gas. So no talk too much about the FSO Nabarima this evening. But thank you for joining us, Richard. How are you? Hi, fine, thanks. Okay, how are you? I'm all right, thank you. But before we get into my first question, which would be like your take on the state of energy in Trinidad and Tobago, I want to ask you, why did you decide to get into this field? And what are some of, the, some of the studies or the path that you took? Because a little while ago, when I hear energy, I think oil and gas. Yes. I don't know if that makes me a dinosaur, but explain, explain your, your, your path thus far, thank you. Okay, um, well, I am first degree, I'm an electrical engineer. I specialize in power and controls. And graduating out of university, uh, my first job was at um, Trinidad and Tobago Electric City Commission, TNTEC. And uh, why I work with the power generation crew. And while working there, I realized that a part for me was not in the same traditional fossil fuel based uh, energy production, but I saw the need for renewable energy. And I did some research into renewable energy and uh, energy efficiency, energy auditing, and so on. And UE, with a joint venture with the University of Flensburg in Germany, offered a renewable energy uh, master's. It was more of a natural science master's, but I thought that it would have been vital for me to pursue it with my engineering background. So I was moving from power generation into from fossil fuels into renewable energy. And while studying it, I developed a passion for it. And now I, it just a second nature to me, everything that in my thoughts is always renewable energy, energy efficiency, and any sort of sustainable development and so on. Now, I appreciate the fact that you said, okay, you went to school, you started working, and then you said, okay, let's see how we can do this a little differently, and you dove a little deeper. And that is something, yes. you know, because sometimes when you start working, it's very easy to get sucked in and remain where you are. The, exactly. You, you could be uncomfortable, but we're making a little something, so we're moving forward with it. Yes, yes, exactly, yes. I, I, just, I just saw the need for the change, and I know the change was coming. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And there weren't much expertise in the area at that time, so I, I took it upon myself to try and be the one of the, the four comers of the renewable energy drive in Trinidad and Tobago. So being on the front end of that movement, what is your take on energy as it is in Trinidad and Tobago? What's your perspective? My perspective is the change needs to come. And I believe that we're taking too long to start the transition. The, based on global statistics, and I can narrow down to the Caribbean, the average cost per kilowatt to convert to solar is $2. And Trinidad is paying 35 cents per kilowatt hour. So that's less around 20% be, below the threshold where you start seeing some economic visibility in going to solar and renewable energy. So by us, the reliant on TNTEC, which is our 100% um, power generation company, um, we, how to put it, like we, the increase in electricity rates need to be there in order for us to really see a big change or actually for us to be beneficial in investing in solar. So spending 35 cents per kilowatt hour compared to spending $2 per kilowatt hour by going to solar, it will not seem economic, economically feasible to the layman. But if the electricity rates was to increase, there will be a much lower or um, a closer threshold or benchmark where we can work with in order for the transition to be smoother and feasible. And with that in mind, I want to talk a little bit about light bulbs. We're not talking, talking about oil and gas right now, but I see right. uh, TNTech, when you go into TNTech to pay a bill, you're getting two light bulbs. These light bulbs are supposed to be more efficient. They're supposed to use less, um, well, like I said, more efficient. What right. can, can you take me through? What would it mean if every household started to use more of those bulbs instead of what it is uh, obtains in many households right now? Okay, um, 
my take on this is that there isn't going to be much significant change. If you go to the mechanic to do uh, maintenance on a vehicle and there are six filters in the car, but he changes one air filter, based on Lehman term, do you really think the car will perform much better or more efficiently? Changing four bulbs in a house with for, for at least to 10 to 15 bulbs is not going to make a difference. The bulbs are the least consuming um, power consumption element in your house. Converting a uh, 100 watt bulb to a 9 watt is a right step, yes, but it isn't the step that we should be making. And the four bulbs per household will not impact the homeowner or the power consumption demand by that great of an effect where it would benefit the country in any way. Um, for example, that one that one LED bulb, right? That one LED bulb can be bo can be on for 24 hours and for a month, and that will only save you um, around ten dollars on electricity bill for a month, well bi monthly. So it's not going to be that great of an impact um, compared to the total energy bill or electricity bill, but it is a right step, but it's not the step. If you can understand what I'm trying to get at. I do. So that, that raises two questions to me. If instead of those two bulbs or those four bulbs, all the bulbs are changed out, what would that mean? And also, if that is not necessarily, if that is a step, what are some of the other steps that we could be taking or should be taking? Right. So right now, Trinidad is, if you walk outside, is like on fire. Um, it's so hot and I don't want to use everyone, but the average home has an air condition right now and everyone is working from home or a lot of people are home and using these air conditions tend to consume a lot of electricity. There can be introduction of tax incentives for inverter air conditioning, which uses uh, around 65 to 70% less energy or even there are solar air conditioning, which we can introduce um, some types of incentives from the government to introduce them or make them standardize, standardize them. So moving forward, no air conditions should be um, solely um, the traditional type, but inverter type or solar. So you have a less drain on the electricity consumption per household. There are also the energy saving um, freezers, fridges. There's also inverter fridge refrigerators uh, which consume 65 to 70% less energy than the traditional ones and these are the the appliances in your home that draws the majority of the current so con compared to um, for example if you have a $2,000 bill for the month saving $10 by changing four bulbs you will not feel it because you're still using your washer your dryer your fridge your freezer air conditions and so on so that is where the real bulk of it is coming from and that's where I really see the right step should be. The, the target, the bigger, the, the, the gulp of it. All right, now I want you to read and spell for me now, Richard. So yes, you're saying inverter in terms of the possibly the refrigerator and the Air AC unit. Yes. What is the difference between the traditional types or the older types, older models, and the inverter? What, where does that difference lie? So when you set your temperature to, for example, 25 degrees on your air conditioning, when it reaches the 25 degree threshold, the condenser outside shuts off and it just blows the air and continuously cycles the 25 degrees. When the temperature in your room raises above this, the condenser kicks in, which draws the current. And that is when um, you actually hear it when you have an air condition, when it kicks in, that draws the current for it to start back to kick in and cool the air. And that is where the current draws. And for example, um, the inverter, sorry, not the example. Um, alternately, the inverter air conditioning, they have some microcontrollers in it which regulate the spinning of the con the mechanics in the condenser. So it always and something called running reserves. So it, it rotates very slowly, and when it when it needs to kick in, it just ramps up. So it don't draw the amount of current or amount of energy that is required compared to the traditional. So it's always just there on standby and it just kicks in with less current draw. So that's why it can have like up 60, 65 to 70% less electricity consumption. Thank you, Richard. That makes so much more sense to me now. We're going to continue this. We're going to continue this conversation. When we return, we're speaking with Richard Ramroton, Man Managing Director of Renergy TT. Stay with us.
Welcome back. We are speaking with Richard Ramratan, the Managing Director of Renergy TT, about renewable energy and the possibilities of such in Trinidad and Tobago. Now, Richard, you were talking about the fact that it feels as though somebody left the furnace to hell open and we're feeling the effects in Trinidad and Tobago. What does that mean for the potential for other types of energy, renewable energy, and I think specifically solar? Tell me where we are at and what was the possibilities here? Okay, so there's a list of renewable energy sources that we can harness, um, but the two main ones uh, feasible for Trinidad is wind and solar. Solar uh, apl applicable to more than 85% of the country where wind may, may be somewhere within the range of around 25 to 30%, more so on the East Coast and towards Tokyo and so on. Um, there's not much windy um, areas on the West Coast. On the east coast, Manzalena stretch, Mayaro, up in Toko, there's a lot of um, a lot of wind on that side that can we can harness the energy from the wind energy. But moving back to the heat now, the solar energy. Um, Trinidad is very, very, very suitable for solar power generation, and a lot of people think that utilizing solar you require sunlight, but that's not the key. You require heat. So the solar panels they use the heat. I don't want to go too in depth with all the monocrystalline and polycrystalline and so on, but within the, the solar panels themselves, when heat is in contact with them, yes, the sunlight has maybe around 20% particle in it, but the other 80% is from the heat, the directional heat onto it. It does its thing in inverted commas. <laughs> I don't want to go too in depth in it. And then the, the, you have DC power coming out of it. So it doesn't matter if you have a cloudy day in Trinidad or a, a clear day, the place is still extremely hot. And based on some testing that was done, um, on a clear day, you can have up to 85% power generation. You can never get 100% from the solar. And on a cloudy and overcast day, you have up to 60%, which is still high for not having any sun directly in contact with the solar panels. So it goes to show that, yes, it's very, very, suitable and feasible for the solar to be um, utilized in Trinidad. But what does that mean for days, or if, if we're talking about rainy season, where we have a lot more cloud cover, even though you say it's not sun, but it's heat, but with the, with the cloud cover, sometimes right. you'd have less heat generated. So does that mean that on the days that there's that heat around, I can get my water heated, I can get this done, I can get that done, but on the days when there isn't that heat, I wish that I had right. other means. So yes, so that it comes to this. Um, the solar power solely, solely depends on your battery backup system that incorporates with it. That's where the power comes from. So the solar power, well, the solar panels charge up these batteries and then the batteries convert, well, the inverters are connected to the batteries which utilize, which converts, sorry, the, the energy stored in the battery and gives you your normal 110 to 20 electricity as you are getting from the all along. So the if you can picture the battery back the battery bank or your storage as a cup of water on a sunny day, you open the pipe on full blast and it fills up in no time. But if say for example Wasa doing some construction on the road and you open it up and it starts to trickle or is of medium pressure, it will take longer to fill up. So within that time period, you'll see say one minute your cup your cup is full but if you have half a minute on the on the full pressure it will fill up so that's when it comes to when you're utilizing the full the sun full potential when you have no clouds the battery bank up the battery backup will charge up within that 12 hour period that we have the sun for when you have the cloud cover or it's mainly overcast yes you will get the power out of the solar panel but because because it's it's trickling the power, not as high as this as the full sun. You will tend to have maybe sixty to seventy-five percent of the battery being fully charged. So that, when you're using the solar at night, it tends to deplete. Maybe by like two, three o'clock in the morning, the battery starts to deplete. So that's the issue with the over being overcast. And that makes me want to ask about storage. So is it that I can I can start off with a certain type of battery bank? and then say, okay, well, I need a little more storage, so I upgrade, or is it a matter of saying there may be something in the works or something that I can organize so that 
I can send my excess into the grid when the pipe is on and is and is fill and is filling really quickly. What kind of things so, do we have in place for that? Right. So I want to answer you. You kind of asked two questions in that um, statement. I want to answer the first one with regards to the battery backup. So solar, in general terms, solar consists of four main items: your solar panels, your charge controller, which takes all your charge from your solar panels and brings it into one. It goes to your battery backup and it goes to the inverter, which gives you your 110 or your 220. That's the main, um, main components of the solar um, power system. So you were asking if you just want to add, say, more batteries or more panels. You can consider it as Lego. You can start up with one battery and 10 panels. And tomorrow you see you need two panels, um, sorry, two batteries and six panels. You can accordingly and just connect them, but it all comes on whatever size of inverter. Your inverter comes like your your generator that you had. So instead of using a hundred watt, I just use in the most general terms, a hundred watt inverter, you just go up to 200 inverter and you compensate for it with the amount of solar panels and batteries you introduce now. So the more you add, the more you, the, the, the larger inverter you just use and you can power your homes based on whatever requirements you have. Um, the second question you were asking with regards say if you have too much pressure and the backflow into the TNT lines, into the water lines. So that's where the main, main, main thing needs to come about from TNTech, which is policy making. And the term for this is called feeding tariffs. So if, for example, your house is consuming one kilowatt of power, and uh, say that one kilowatt of power in solar is costing 20000 but you say you want to spend $30,000 and invest in a two kilowatt one time. Right now, presently, you will just have to have that one kilowatt excess of power wasting. Whereby if you have feeding tariffs with a smart grid system, that extra one kilowatt that you're not using, you can push it back into TNTech grid with it being regulated and so on by TNTech and you can be compensated or, and you can have either, you have different payment mechanisms. TNTech can give you rebates or you can get like a, a point system and at the end of the year, you reclaim the points back and something and any, any sort of that. So that's, that's the main, main stepping stone that needs to be taken with regards to installation of power in homes. So once we can utilize a grid tie system with this, with this smart, with a, a smart meter, it will be able to tie in the solar with the NDEC grid. And you can either pull more or you can push back into the NDEC grid. So there's, there'll all be a balance. So you'll never be too worried about the solar or too worried about the TNTEC bill. Do you see a win-win for that with TNTEC? I can see a win-win on the side of the homeowner. Is there a reason or incentive for TNTEC to do that? I wouldn't say there's a reason for an incentive because at the end of the day, if, if it is introduced and, uh, for example, tomorrow you win the lotto and you say you want to power your entire house solar but you want to go a little extra, come, uh, come Friday, once tomorrow it's installed, come Friday, you wouldn't have to pay and take any money again but they will have to pay you if you're generating more than you're consuming so you can use say uh, for example again you can buy a 10 kilowatt system and you use one kilowatt but you're pushing nine kilowatts into the TNT grid they will have to pay you with that surplus and you would not have to pay any electricity bill because you're already getting it from the solar power so that's where the discussion comes in as to where the economic feasibility comes in with TNT. it works out really good in some countries where the, the power generation company and so on are privatized but since the government 100% owns TNTech and well, TGU by extension, which is the power generation company, it tends to bring a sticky situation where the policy making is concerned. And definitely something that we'd want to continue. They say it's a good day when you learn something. It's been a great day today, and we want to thank you for being part of that great day, Richard. And on nothing, behalf nothing, of the nothing, entire nothing. news team, I'm DK Rasta. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a good night.